You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. I read a wonderful letter telling about the courage of one man in going to the cabin where his nephew had a gun. He had a strong suspicion that this young man, who was a very confused young man and had had a bad background and had a lot of hatred in his heart, he was suspicious that he was walking into some very real danger by seeking to disarm this man. His wife fasted and prayed while he went. And when she heard the car drive into the driveway, it wasn't her husband, it was the Royal Canadian Mounted Police to inform her that her husband had been shot and killed. We read a passage from 1 Corinthians which speaks of our faith being in God's power. That's where it has to rest. We are weak, all of us. Sometimes people come up to me and say, well, you're so strong, but I am not strong like that. I can't do what you do. If I appear to be strong, let me say, it's not my own strength. There are a lot of things that I have tried to do in my own strength, and I've made a mess of things. The words that I'm giving you on this program, I do earnestly intend to be always in conformity with what God says. We're talking about supernatural things, not about natural things. The things that we point to are the supernatural things. Of course, we are talking about the ways in which our nature and natural temperaments and emotions and all the rest of it are to be brought under God's control. It's God's power to which we look. Probably one of the greatest weaknesses common to men is the fear of revealing weakness. Am I right about that? Let me say that again. I think, probably, one of the greatest weaknesses which is common to men is the fear of revealing their own weakness. Women, on the other hand, talk about problems. I don't really think men talk much about problems. I heard a psychologist on Dr. Dobson's program one time say a very interesting thing about an observation that he had made of the differences between men and women. And he said, women talk about everything. Men don't talk about much of anything. They tell stories. And I've been thinking about that ever since. It's been a number of years since I heard that. But I think it's generally true that men certainly don't talk about everything. Maybe they do a lot of things besides telling stories. They like to tell stories, too. But they talk about sports and money and business. But they don't, generally speaking, as far as I know, and maybe I'm wrong, it doesn't seem to me that they're likely to share their weaknesses with each other or to talk about problems. In fact, my husband, Ad Leach, one time said to me, the reason that men would never be interested in talking about the subject of marriage would be because it would be an admission that there might be problems. And if a man goes for counseling, it is an admission that he's got a problem. Men don't like to have problems. Well, maybe I'll get some really angry letters from people saying, you have made some outrageous statements and that's your prejudice. But there might be somebody listening to me who will be helped by the things that I have to say today about men's weakness. And let me use the example of the great Apostle Paul. He, a strong, powerful, godly man whom God had completely transformed, a man who had actually persecuted Christians and thought he was doing God a favor by killing them, was transformed wasn't he, when he was on the road to Damascus. He was struck to the ground, and God said, Why are you persecuting me? I am Jesus, whom you persecute. Paul thought it was just these Christians that he hated that he was persecuting, and he found out that he was, in fact, persecuting the Son of God. And he was completely converted. But he has a lot to say about weakness. He, a giant in the faith, a hard-hitting messenger from God who brooked 
no-nonsense from the Christians he was responsible to teach, he was a man who spoke candidly and humbly about weakness. In 1 Corinthians 12, he refers to a strange and unusual spiritual experience that he had had. And in verse 7, he says, "...to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations." There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That little story is one of the most important ones in the whole Bible, I think. Paul was given a thorn in the flesh. He prayed that God would take it away, prayed three times, and God's answer was, no, I'm not going to take it away. My grace is all you need. An answer to those who would say that if you have enough faith, God will heal you of your physical diseases. Often God wants to heal you. Often he does. But then there are the times when his answer is, no, you don't need a miracle. I'm going to leave that thorn there for a while so that you can learn the far more important lesson. My grace is sufficient. And you will not be able to receive that grace in all its fullness until you acknowledge your weakness. Until you say, yes, Lord, I will accept this thorn, this weakness, this problem, this insoluble thing. I receive it gladly. I begin to learn to delight in it as I receive it. Paul says, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, hardships, persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And he goes on in verse 15 of that chapter to say, I will very gladly spend for you everything I have and expend myself as well. If I love you more, will you love me less? Be that as it may, I have not been a burden to you. He was willing to spend and to be spent. And in the following chapter, he speaks of Christ's weakness. A very important concept. He says in 2 Corinthians 13, On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier, or any of the others, since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. Now, Paul is writing here to the church in Corinth, and he, being an apostle, has authority in that church, and so he is going to have to go back and straighten out some difficulties. But he says, since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me, I want you to remember that he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he, Christ, was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power we will live with him to serve you. It's overwhelming to think of the fact that the Lord of the universe, the hands that formed the stars and everything that is made, that he was put into the hands of of sinful men and nailed to a cross. Those hands that shaped the shell on the beach, that shaped the baby that lies in your arms, that shaped everything in this world, those hands were nailed to a cross, helpless, immobile. He was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. I don't know today what your weakness is, you who are listening to me. You know some of your weaknesses. Most of us could write quite a long list. And yet, as we grow older, 
God reveals to us weaknesses that we've always had that we never even thought of as weaknesses, and thereby gives us the opportunity to draw on His power for overcoming those weaknesses. Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Even though we may seem to have failed, for we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong, and our prayer is for your perfection. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.